Welcome once again. Right now we're at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, according to the promise of the life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In order to take the scriptures in proper context, we must always remember the author of the book that we're reading. In this case, this is a letter to Timothy. The author is Paul. The audience is Timothy. As I always say, when we're reading Paul's letters, we're actually reading somebody else's mail. Paul goes on, I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a pure conscience. How unceasing is my memory of you in my petitions. In other words, prayers. Night and day, longing to see you, Remembering your tears, that I may be filled with joy, having been reminded of the sincere faith that is in you, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in you also. For those of you who believe that every single word of the New Testament is God's personal word for you today, well, guess what? You have a mother by the name of Eunice. Did you know that your mother's name is Eunice? Did you know that your grandmother's name is Lois? Yeah, God said it to you. And of course, I'm just making a point here. I mean, this is Paul writing to Timothy. This is not God's word personally for you today. Don't get me wrong. We can learn a lot from Paul's letters. And Paul imparts a lot of wisdom and knowledge to his audience. For this cause, I remind you that you should stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but endure hardship. And yes, hardship is part of our walk with the Lord. But endure hardship for the good news, for the gospel, according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before times eternal, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the good news. For this, I was appointed as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this cause, I also suffer these things. I want you to notice up here that Paul said that the Lord has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. There is a huge misunderstanding in the church today. We're saved by grace, right? Not by works. So we don't have to obey God. We just have to just believe because it says we're not saved by works. Now, what you need to understand here is the context in which Paul said this. This is hugely important because again, a lot of, may I say, hell-bound sinners, yes, a lot of criminals in the kingdom of God uses this whole theology of not by works to excuse their sin, to say, oh, you know what, it's okay. God understands. You know, God knows my heart. I'm a sinner, but God knows my heart. <laughs> I like to say, you know what, God does know your heart. And in Jeremiah, God said that your heart is desperately wicked. But what does Paul mean here when he says, not by works? So we're not saved by works. If you really study the context of Paul's letters, what he teaches, what he preaches, he's not talking about obedience versus sin or righteousness versus sin because he said very clearly over and over and over again. I mean, I'm thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5. He lists a whole lot of sins. And he says, if you do any of these things, that's pretty much every sin you can imagine, because he, at the end he says, anything like this, you know, all of these sins or anything like this, which really would include every sin. He says, if you do this, you will not 
inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So that is very important. You need to take that in context. So what does Paul mean when he says not by works? Because he says not by works on one hand, but then on the other hand, he says, listen, you've got to obey God in these things because if you don't, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it appears like Paul is saying, well, you're not saved by what you do, by your obedience, but if you don't obey in these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It seems to be contradictory. But listen, when you really, really boil it down, there are only two ways to really interpret this in context. The first way is that there are the works of the law and there are the non-works of the law or the negative works parts of the law. There's the positive commandments and the negative commandments. There are 248 positive commandments and 365 negative commandments. The positive commandments are the commandments that tells you to do something, to perform some kind of work. Whereas the negative commandments are the commandments that command you not to do something or abstain from a work. So let's say, for example, you've got a lot of hypocrites, a lot of sinners, then they want to show themselves to be holy. They want to show themselves that they obey God, okay? They might go to church, they go to you know a place of worship and, and all this kind of stuff, and they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Typically, such a hypocrite will do the do's. They will perform the works. They will do what God said to do. Now, it's very easy to prove that someone actually performs the works because you can say, I saw him do this. I saw him do that. You might have witnesses. Hypocrites typically do what they do in public so that they can be seen as someone who's holy or righteous, virtue signaling, you know? So, it's easy to prove that someone actually performs the positive commandments that they are supposed to perform. But it's not easy to prove that they don't do what they shouldn't be doing. In other words, that they abstain from the works that they're supposed to abstain from, that they are compliant with the 365 negative commandments. In other words, someone can go out in the public and among friends, among family, when someone is watching them, when they got eyes on them, it's easy to say, well, yeah, I see that they're reading the Bible, they're doing this, they're doing that, you know, they're good Christians. But what do they do behind closed doors? What do they do in secret? Do they violate the negative commands? And that is almost impossible to prove. So if you were preaching to a whole bunch of hypocrites who were doing all the do's just to be seen and to have the praise of men and to look good, but they perform the works that they shouldn't be performing, the negative commands, they don't obey the negative commands, then how would you tell them that they will not inherit the kingdom of God? One way to do it is to do what Paul did here, to tell them that you're not saved by the works of the law only, but you have to also be obedient to the non-works of the law. You have to also be compliant and obedient to the negative commands. You have to be obedient to the entire law, not just the works, but also to abstain from the works that you're supposed to abstain from. And that makes sense that Paul would say, hey, listen, you're not saved by the works, but you're doing all these things. And if you do any of these things and anything like it, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's one way to interpret Paul's teaching on the works of the law. The second way to interpret it is to look at the big picture in Paul's theology. If you followed me throughout my journey through Paul's letters, you know that we ran across several instances where Paul strongly taught the doctrine of predestination. One such example of that is in Romans chapter 9, where Paul teaches very clearly and very explicitly the doctrine of predestination. He said, look at Jacob and Esau. They were twins, and in their mother's womb, before they had a chance to do anything good or evil, God said, I love Jacob and I hate Esau. So before Jacob had a chance to do anything good, God set his love upon Jacob. And before Esau had a chance to do anything bad, God said, I hate Esau. 
And I know some people would say, oh, but God loves everybody. When God said, I hate Esau, he didn't really mean it that way. He just meant that God didn't, just didn't like Esau as much. But look at how Esau turned out. Look what he got as a lot in life. I mean, he got the shortest straw. He got the bad portion in every turn. And I know some people might say, well, well, God just knew the future and what Esau would, would choose and all that kind of thing. And you can look at it that way, but that is not the way that Paul presents it in Romans chapter 9. I encourage you to go back to my teaching on Romans chapter 9 for more details. But just in a nutshell, Paul said very explicitly that God chose to love Jacob and hate Esau before they had a chance to do anything good or evil. So in that way, you can say, well, Jacob was saved not by works. You see what I mean? It was not by works that Jacob was saved. God loved Jacob and God chose Jacob for eternal salvation without ever having a chance to do or say anything good. And likewise, Esau was doomed for failure, doomed for the wrath of God before he had a chance to do anything evil. He was condemned without works, just as Jacob was saved without works. You can put it this way. Jacob got the favor and love of God, not according to works, whereas Esau got the wrath and hatred of God, not according to works. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.